thank you for having me uh, this evening. As you can't mention, we uh, got together and talked while we were at an FDA uh, conference up in Arlington, and he <coughs> said, hmm, I have an idea. <laughs> we need speakers, and maybe you could come to ASQ. So I said, I uh, uh, would love to do that, and picked a couple of topics out, and uh, he said the design control would be of interest to some. So. I'll make my disclaimer, if you didn't already get a beer, sorry, <laughs> might have made this go much faster, much smoother, but you know, you had your chance, so. Um, we're going to talk about the value of design control. How many um, folks in here are either currently or have been um, involved with design control in the medical device industry? About a half a dozen or so, maybe, maybe eight. Um, even though what I'm talking about is specific to medical device design, um, it certainly has implications. It's basically good engineering practices. So anytime you're developing something, you know, regardless of what it's for, um, it's about the documentation and the decision making as you go through that process to bring a design, a new product to market. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about device controls and what the regulations are for that, because a lot of people may not be familiar with it. Um, the evidence of need, why design controls are, are important to us. A couple of failures um, that are related to design control that can make the point of, wow, we should have done um, you know, a little more diligence on that up front. Um, some drawbacks, uh, which are maybe perceived drawbacks and maybe real. Uh, a few tips for success as uh, those of us in the quality industry are always trying to bring people into our fold and uh, the benefits of the design control as well. So in the overview, um, anybody familiar with pharmaceuticals, you use uh, uh, 21 CFR, 210 and 211 kind of as your guiding principles. Um, device is, is a little bit similar in that. Uh, they do uh, CFR 820 for the quality, um, the quality management system for the whole um, uh, industry, but then uh, 820.30 is actually the specific part for design controls. So the intent of it is to assure the device is safe and effective. Um, that's really all FDA is after, is something is safe and effective. Obviously, we're also trying to make money. So we have a third element as, as folks in the business. Um, so in these design control elements, um, the FDA really spells out what's required for inputs to the design, the outputs, what you get from that, design review, Verification and validation, sometimes <coughs> referred to as V and V, that can be on the software side and on the hardware um, device side. Um, transferring that design into production, building a design history file, which is basically a huge pile of documentation, and uh, then managing that design through change control. Similar in other industries, this is not, not unique. So first of all, I'll tell you about uh, the design inputs. This is your physical and performance requirements um, that come in, and there that's your basis for the design. What is it that you're going to build? And in looking at this, I just threw in an example of a blood glucose meter. Thought a lot of people might be able to relate to um, that type of a device, and. Um, listed out a, f a few things under each of these headings. It, the documents um, for the design requirements ends up being very, very long because you are spelling out every single requirement that this device has to have. So as an example, um, of the physical requirements, you might specify the weight of this. And if y'all seen the glucose meters anymore, they're about as big as my finger, some of them, but you know, they're somewhere in the order of about this size, very thin, very lightweight. Um, so there's some dimensional requirements, weight requirements. And if you go into the, to the functional, which could be also under performance, but um, say it's going to do readings of blood glucose in this range, say 20 to 600 um, milligrams per deciliter, 
and we wanted to have an auto shut off after two minutes so the device isn't uh, running down the batteries. Performance, um, we want the test time to be five seconds. Uh, we want the memory to hold 500 readings before you have to, say, download it to a computer or something like that. And then you have some interface requirements. Again, these are related to performance, but um, you know that it's simple for home use, um, that you can download the readings. You might uh, talk about something with the display size. You have a wide range of people that would um, be using this, uh, this device. I thought you might find it interesting. I was on a product development team at Johnson & Johnson on disposable staplers. Uh -huh. And part of the uh, design inputs they wanted, uh, they actually, because the product was so light, they just added a weight inside the handle because the surgeon <coughs> thought Unless it's heavy, it's not expensive, so they put it just there, just to add weight so the surgeons had some weight in their hand when they were handling the device. Very just nice. Just a perception of that. Perception of that. Yes? Now, on, on your last slide, you didn't show anything about precision. You gave it a range, but is there any Yeah, I was just listing out a couple of examples under each, but yeah, you would actually have really pages and pages under each of these sections. Um, of everything that that uh, device had to do performance wise and then you know dimensional and physical wise. So that was a good point Todd because where do you get these inputs? Who says it has to be this, it has to be that, it has to do this? And um, externally you want to know that from the end user and from a clinician and depending on the device if it's a home glucose meter obviously you're going to want the person who's actually using it and that's children, that's um, the wide range of population, it's elderly, it's people maybe with visual issues because of uh, diabetes. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration and you want to get that feedback from them. Um, and the clinician, in the case Todd mentioned, they want the device to be heavier. Um, you know, you want something that's uh, portable in this example and, and um, the clinician is often who sometimes is training uh, the person on how to use that device. So, And then uh, also externally you have industry standards and depending on the type of device there may be a very specific st standard say for uh, radiation or mammography or something like that and then others that are much more general that would apply to any type of device. Then you have your internal sources, people in marketing and sales, manufacturing, quality, engineering, all have some type of input into this, um, how this device should be. So you're listening to the user, but you know um, from your experience there's certain things it's going to have to have or do in order for it to be effective, in order for it to um, get cleared through the FDA for you to be able to actually market that device. The real key is you have to get the input from the end user. You can design all kinds of really cool stuff. You can make it really cheaply, but if the people that are using it are just not interested or it just doesn't have the features that they want, then you've really failed. So this interaction um, and really throughout the design process, because you're going to design maybe a prototype um, and then go back and maybe and you know it's an iterative process. You get some feedback, let people touch it, play with it, use it, and uh, go back and make some changes to it. So once you get all those inputs, we need to turn them into outputs. And this is the results of your design effort. And um, in this case, your results in this stage of it is often um, a lot of documentation. So you have your design requirements document. And this is where you take what the inputs were and turn them into measurable um, things that uh, you can go in and test later on. So in this case, results shall be displayed in milligrams per deciliter. And shall is um, the terminology that's used in this case because you can have some things that say it may, you know, it, it, if it's not as critical of an element, you can have some latitude on that. But the things that are, that it must be are the shalls. The results shall be displayed in two seconds. So you want a really short test time and be able to